Now here's a great aircraft you don't often see on display, made famous by astronaut Gus Grissom and movie star Tom Cruise in the movie Top Gun. This is the F-14 Tomcat and it was designed for uh, air defense of the fleet. What's really interesting about this aircraft is that it's a swing wing. Uh, right now you can see it's in the swept back position. It uh, has a computer controlled system that uh, brings the wings forward or back depending on uh, the, the flight attitude. It's quite a machine. Next I want to introduce to you a friend of mine who uh, lives and works in the Topeka, Kansas area. His name is Ken Kelly and he sells powered parachutes there and trains people how to fly them. Here's Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Ken Kelly. I'm a six-shooter dealer. I give instruction and sell powered parachutes. And uh, this is my flying field. I keep about a 400-foot uh, circle diameter mode. And then, as you can see, if you look around, we've got plenty of room for students to take off. They can take off in any direction that their wind's from. And uh, we don't have any trees or obstructions or any uh, problems close by that could create a hazard. Um, I use a little golf cart to, uh, I can taxi up if they're not ready to taxi and they can drive the golf cart up so it makes it convenient for them, they don't have to do a lot of walking. With a circular field you can take off uh, into the wind no matter where the wind direction, you know, what, what the wind direction is from. Uh, with powered parachutes you don't want to do any crosswind landings or takeoffs. You always want to land and take off into the wind, they're just not suited for crosswind uh, takeoff and landing. So with a circular field it doesn't matter where the wind's from. I've flown a few times with some friends, little Cessnas and some Pipers, and um, to me, quite frankly, uh, I found them a little bit boring. I feel like I'm boxed in. The view isn't real good, and you have this hammering, this, and the noise and the res resonation of the the uh, cockpit around you, and it's just. Uh, you're moving too fast to really see what you want. You have to fly at altitudes that uh, make it difficult to spot things. Um, so, you know, after I'd done a little bit of flying, I saw that uh, that, uh, that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I mean, for transportation, they're great, you know, to get from point A to point B. But I wasn't interested in that. I, I use a car or I fly commercial for transportation. I simply was interested in recreational flying, the fun of flying, the flying of, the fun of being above and looking down, seeing a bird's eye view and not having anything obstructing you. And uh, I'd flown some fixed wing ultralights, some small ones. And quite frankly, uh, really, you're so busy keeping the thing in shape and flying it and that you really uh, miss a lot. You can't quite relax, or at least I can't relax to the extent I can on a powered parachute. When you get a powered parachute up and you trim it, you can you can just relax. It's your hands are totally free. You need no hands. You you steer it with your feet, and it's uh, you have no shock or vibration. It's um, it's like um, flying on a porch swing or or kind of like a magic carpet. It's just uh, uh, so relaxing and soothing. It's mesmerizing, and. Uh, Although uh, fixed wings can be fun because you can do a little more with them, you know, and, and uh, they are faster. Uh, some of them are quite faster. Um, if speed's your thing, a powered parachute definitely isn't a craft. But uh, if just fun hanging there and just being up there is what you like to do, uh, powered parachutes really fits the bill. I can uh, take them out of my garage or out of the hangar, taxi them right down here lay the chute out behind it, and in five minutes, pre-flight it real well, warm it up, and in five minutes, I'm ready to fly. It's convenience, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I uh, of course, have another job, another business, like a lot of people do, so time's a premium for me. And uh, one of the nice things about a powered parachute is it's so fat, you, come, you can come to it, get on it, and be flying it quickly, put it away, and, uh, what little bit of time you have for flying, you can use flying, and you don't have a lot of uh, uh, other things to contend with. You don't have to drive to an airport because there's a hangar at an airport to keep it in. Uh, you don't. Uh, if if you live in town and you have powered parachute, they're real easy to load on just the smallest little trailer. Um, you know uh, the 
smallest and most inexpensive trailer that you have will handle a powered parachute real easily. And you, if you have a friend that has a small grassy area, you know, with enough room to take off and land safely, you can tow it there, take it off and fly and, and come back. And again, you don't have wings to disassemble or anything to trailer it or transport it. Uh, when it comes to training on any kind of aircraft, and powered parachutes no exception, you want to make sure that you have a qualified at least a BFI or an AFI to train you. It's a basic flight instructor, or advanced flight instructor. that's qualified on powered parachutes. Um, powered parachutes really the easiest aircraft there is to fly and statistically it's the safest. It's safer even than hot air balloons. Now you have a big canopy over you and as long as you've pre-flighted the craft and you have a, a, a basic instruction of uh, how, when, and where to fly there's no reason there should ever be any problems. Um, if you're flying a powered parachute right, there's no way that you can make it hit the ground hard enough to damage the craft or yourself. Uh, they're very forgiving. You want to make sure, w if you're going to take instruction from someone on a powered parachute, uh, that you, they have a good place to fly from. You don't want to have to uh, narrow runway with trees on each side where you, you have to try to uh, do a little bit of crosswind landing or taking off. or. Uh, run into the possibility of the wind changing after you've been flying around for a while and then have to try to make crosswind landing. So it's important to have a nice safe place to fly from as well as uh, a qualified instructor. Um, a person should never uh, cheat on his times. The, the regulations that are set up by the FAA in Part 103 are, uh, are very good regulations. They're uh, Definitely, they don't make you jump through too many hoops. Everything that uh, they ask for is, in my opinion, necessary, and it's a good, sound training program. You want to try to find an instructor that uh, has, has the time uh, to spend with you. In other words, he needs to have really flexible hours so that when the weather's right, uh, that you can go and fly with him, that you're not trying to, to accommodate his schedule instead of really ideal flying weather for learning, because when you learn um, in any kind of aircraft, and especially powered parachutes, you want to have a very minimum amount of wind. Uh, I won't allow a student to solo the first time in more than six mile an hour wind. I'll give them a manual, a small uh, manual to study, and it uh, gives a little bit about weather, uh, a little bit about uh, aerodynamics, how the pendulum effect uh, that powered parachutes fly by and uh, just general knowledge uh, that they should uh, know before they solo the first time. I send that home with them and make them study it. And then uh, I'll take them up uh, maybe that time or maybe the next time they come out, I'll take them up with me and we'll fly around. But before I solo them, I'll give them an oral quiz on uh, the powered parachute uh, test that I've given them and make sure that they've read it and they fully understand it. And uh, once I'm satisfied that they really do understand it, then I also uh, give them really uh, thorough pre-flight uh, instruction on the craft before I allow them to solo too. I want them to understand uh, before I let them solo how to make sure that the craft they're going to fly on is safe. If I'm going to solo a person the first time, I don't want to bring a bunch of friends or people that might distract them. You know, I like to have their undivided attention to make sure they're paying attention to me and learning what they need to learn. Uh, a single seat uh, ultralight uh, that falls into the, uh, the uh, parameters of being considered an ultralight by the FAA requires uh, the pilot, it doesn't require any license or training of the pilot. But any person that gets into a fixed wing ultralight or a powered parachute without instruction from a qualified instructor is really foolhardy. They're taking a big risk and in my opinion they're using poor judgment. I'd mentioned how little space a powered parachute takes to, for storage. Um, my daytime job, I got a metal fabricating business, and this is uh, a little building that I designed for powered parachutes. And uh, the whole front opens. You can slide the powered parachute, just roll it right in there and close the doors. And, and uh, the building weighs about 550 pounds, so you just screw it down with dog augers so the wind doesn't get a hold of it. But they're real portable. You can, if a person has a little flying field that they can use, they can take it out and screw it down in the flying field and use it for storage. Uh, or they can pick it up and move it whenever they want, you know, uh, to another location or sell it. So 
Uh, it's kind of a little idea I had that's specifically for powered parachutes. And uh, it's only 10 foot long and, and uh, 8 foot wide, so uh, and that's plenty of room for a powered parachute. This is a small building that I had put up last year. It gives me a nice, clean little area to um, put assemble these. When it, if a person buys a, a powered parachute from me and they want me to assemble it, I'll assemble it for them, or they can assemble it themselves. They come in a kit form. I make some of the, I manufacture the screen guards. They keep the grass, uh, tall grass, if you land the grassy field, keeps the grass out of the prop. And uh, I manufacture dashes for the older model six shooters, some of the things like this that hold gauges. And um, they're a straightforward little thing that has good visibility and takes a vibration away from the gauges so that the gauges hold up real well. As you can see, these are, the weight is balanced on the rear axle on these. It's real well balanced. They're very light and easy to handle, easy to move around. Again, the portability, the, the convenience of these. Um, uh, children, women don't have any trouble handling these. It doesn't have to be a big person to be able to, to easily handle a powered parachute. Tell you what, I'll just take this outside, move it around a little bit so you can see how easy they are to handle. I just picked it up with a couple fingers. And just roll it around. The easiest way to handle them, really, is by the prop in uh, the cage. Just like this, just roll it around. If you want to turn it, you can just step on the back here, spin it around. This is a SR2 model here. That means a Skyrider two-seater or two-place instructional vehicle. The pilot sits in the front and the student sits in the back. It's very comfortable for both pilot and student. The, the things that make a powered parachute uh, so safe and so, so forgiving to fly is, uh, I mentioned earlier, the pendulum effect. And uh, when your canopy is deployed and flying above you, the way you get a rate of climb or develop climb is by acceler increasing the uh, throttle and increasing the thrust which pushes the craft out ahead of the canopy and twists the canopy up changing the angle of attack and that causes you to climb. You have lines from the front of the canopy and the back which form a triangle and when you thrust out forward like this it changes the angle of attack and you climb and inversely when you pull the throttle back its natural position is a slight incline and when you want to land these you simply pull the throttle back and land it. You can land these dead stick the same as with the engine running. They'll come down just as handle just the same. Because the centrifugal force of your turn plus the foiling of the right side of the wing, you automatically always achieve the exact proper uh, turn ratio. You, you are never, uh, when you turn, you are never pushed sideways either way. You're always pushed down. The, the gravity, your, your G's are always always positive against you, straight down. So you're always very comfortable. You never feel like you're going to be thrown out of it or you're going to fall out. Uh, another thing that's unique to powered parachutes uh, is the deck angle that you achieve when you um, make your first takeoff. When you make your first solo, a, a pilot that is experienced, uh, I, kind of, I do a lot of stressing on the angle attack that they achieve will be greater than what they're used to flying general aviation. And uh, they take off and will climb at such a nice steep angle that uh, a seasoned pilot will uh, all of a sudden to have this feeling that he's, he's going to go over or he's going to uh, stall it because he, he can tell his wind speed, his air speed's not very great, but he's got this tremendous angle of attack and it makes you think, think you're going to fall back if you're an experienced pilot. Someone who's never flown doesn't even realize it. They just know they're just going up a nice steep angle. But someone who is used to general aviation, it kind of is unnerving the first time they do it. And then they realize it's perfectly safe. They fly about 26 miles an hour, and this will, this will have a climb rate between eight and 900 feet per minute. If you do the mathematics on it, airspeed versus, you can see you have a tremendous climb rate with these. They really climb out nice. So that's another thing that makes them safe. Uh, you, can get, you can gain altitude quickly. You can turn these things. With full throttle, we'll climb and turn.
You can put them as hard a turn as you can get them, and they will still climb at full throttle. So it allows you to take off in a smaller area than you can with some fixed wings. These are capable of flying to 12,000 feet. Um, no one has business of being up into that kind of airspace because you're getting up with uh, faster moving aircraft. Another nice, real safe uh, safety feature inherent in powered parachutes is you have this great big bright canopy that, that uh, other pilots can see. Visibility is your best friend when you're flying. You want to be seen. And you're moving slow up there. It's like a hot air balloon. That's an advantage of a hot air balloon. They're easy to see. And if other pilots are doing their job the way they're supposed to, you can't always count on that, but if they're doing their job, they will see you. And uh, it helps avoid uh, accidents if you can be seen real well. After you've done a thorough pre-flight on your craft, made sure that everything on it is correct, everything's uh, right, there's no question in your mind about anything, all the bolts look good, and you've warmed it up thoroughly, and you have deployed the canopy habit laying out behind you, you know that you're set directly into the wind, You've got a windsock ahead of you or a ribbon that you can monitor at all times so when you're ready to take off you can take a last minute check on the actual wind direction. Uh, you have all that done, you simply get in, get in the seat, fasten your safety belt good and secure. And if there's a lot of loose end, wrap it up so it doesn't flop around and whip you. And uh, put your helmet on, good approved safety helmet. And you turn the ignition switches on and reach up behind you and grab the pull rope, give it a pull and start the engine. Make sure it's running good again. You have two ignitions on these powered parachutes, on the six shooters, on these Rotec engines. And uh, the last thing you do is you bring it up to a comfortable RPM, you turn the one ignition off to watch for a 300, about a 300 RPM drop, turn it back on, then turn the other one off, turn it on, and you know at least at that moment you have two completely uh, good working ignition systems that are independent of each other, so you have redundancy. After you're satisfied that both ignitions are working properly, and the engine's running right, sounds good, you've checked and, and your airspace is clear where you're going to take off, there's no other aircraft or big birds approaching you, you simply put your feet up on the steering tubes or the front of the craft and you advance the throttle forward, increasing the the engine thrust. You'll roll forward three or four foot and you'll feel a, something like a brake being put on. It'll kind of push you forward and that's the canopy catching the air. It's called a canopy is popping. And when it starts to pop, just like when you lay a kite on the ground, you pull a string, the kite tries to go up. The canopy does the same thing. And it starts to inflate. Air rushes into the front of the canopy, pressurizing the cell and starts inflating it and making it rigid. You increase the throttle gradually and watch the canopy come up overhead. And once it's overhead, now you're rolling along the ground about maybe 50% throttle. And it's centered. If the canopy's over this way, it means the crosswind's coming in from the right. So you'd simply turn the nose wheel to the right, steer that way, and maybe give it a little right pedal until you're centered around the canopy and it's stable. Then you go to full throttle. And when you do that, you'll, in a matter of seconds, you'll be leaving the ground and on your way to having a very pleasant trip. Now you only have two controls on a powered parachute. You have the throttle, which is your vertical control. Increase the throttle to climb, decrease the throttle to come down. Then you have steering rudders or rudder pedals. And uh, this is a rudder pedal on the right. You push the right one and this line pulls the back of the canopy down and stalls, tip stalls uh, the right side of the canopy and puts you into a right hand bank and you'll make a nice gradual right hand turn. If you want to make a really hard turn, you want to turn tight and you have plenty of altitude, you can push it forward and then grab the line and pull in some more line to turn real tight. Uh, these things will, about the only thing that maneuvers is a helicopter. They, they will turn very tight. They're very maneuverable. They'll climb at a really great angle. And but the only thing, you can't make them come down very fast. You can't make them come down hard enough to hurt you or the craft on a straight descent. On a powered parachute, on a six-shooter, especially a two-seater or single-seater, you really only have a, a few basic adjustments to make to accommodate a pilot's weight. And uh, the basic adjustment, the main adjustment is called a CG adjustment or the center of gravity. And the way you achieve that is you simply pull this pin out 
and you lengthen this by one inch and put the pin through another hole. And what this does is this changes the deck angle when you're in level flight and it adjusts for the pilot's weight because the pilot's actually sitting ahead of the center of gravity of the craft because you're flying on these cables. This is what you're suspended on, or these cables. So that's your center of gravity. Uh, you never have to make any adjustment for the student, you know, riding on the back of it because they're almost dead center, center of gravity. So the CG adjustment is for the pilot's weight only. Uh, a heavier pilot, you have to move the CGs forward or shorten these tubes, which brings the center of gravity forward to accommodate the pilot's weight, extra weight out in front of the center of gravity. And uh, inversely, for the rear, you have to, if they're lighter, you would move the CGs back a little farther. Um, CG adjustments, you got about a 40 pound range. It, it's not real critical. Uh, and the, the deck angle isn't real critical. It's best to fly the deck uh, from slightly above level to, to way above level. You don't really want to fly it with a nose wheel when you're in level flight down because it can cause a landing and takeoff uh, problem. Uh, if an experienced pilot would have no problem with it, a student might have a little difficulty if, if you don't have the CG set right. Um, of course, with any, like with any aircraft, you want everything as right as possible and to make it as easy and, and uh, trouble-free to fly as possible. The only other adjustment, of course, is it's called trimming the chute, and that's the length of the steering lines. And most of the canopy manufacturers will have a painted, painted spot on the steering line that indicates a starting point where to tie the line so that the, the lines have the right tension. If the lines are too tight, um, that's a dangerous situation because that's like having the flaps down on an airplane, trying to take off the flaps down, and it stalls the canopy. The canopy won't come up right, it'll tend to stall, and it doesn't have a, a uh, good climb rate. It's better if the steering lines are too loose because you can always pull in plenty of lines. So when you do the initial setup, when you're building the craft, putting one together or test flying one uh, the first time or putting a new canopy on or whatever, it's always best to make sure you got plenty of line out. You know, you tie it long. And then you take it up and fly it and you look and see how much how much they bellow down, you know, the steering lines. And if there's a lot of slack, then you simply land it and you take up a little bit and you try it again until you just have a slight bellow in the lines and the canopy is not pulled down in the back on level flight. And that way, after you move just an inch or two, then you actually start bringing the, the canopy down on that side that you're, that you're moving. A technique in landing too is called a flare. When you're coming down, and let's say you're in a gusty wind condition, you're coming right in the wind and the wind will be blowing hard, you'll be going through areas where there's wind and then no wind. It, or you got some mechanical turbulence or something taking place, or thermal turbulence. And let's say you're coming down and the chute gets out ahead of you and all the, you've got some wind and all of a sudden the wind stops, you, you, your descent can increase slightly and uh, make you bounce, you know. But what you can do at the last minute if this happens, you can simply push both pedals forward, which is, it has the same effect of dropping the flaps and it'll make a nice cushion landing for you. And it's called a flare technique and it works real well. When I'm flying along the ground, what's fun for me at night when it gets nice and fairly smooth, I'll fly all over the contours of my pastures, maybe six inches to 12 inches off the grass, just almost touching the grass. And at night, I just this is the funnest flying because it takes the greatest precision. It really, you can really show off your flying skills to be able to make hard turns, adjust your throttle and everything to accommodate the loss and altitude you make with a turn and everything and stand right down along the ground. And the way you do that, once you get your throttle set, I can set my throttle and I can fly along right above the ground using nothing but the pedals. Just simply, if I start to go down, just flaring it momentarily. Just a momentary thing. And when it starts to come up, what that does when you flare them, it puts the brakes on the canopy. It stalls it, which pulls the canopy back, which changes the angle of attack. When you release the flare, the wing flies easier, the canopy flies easier, and it'll roll ahead again, changing it. So when you're in a gusty situation, by simply using the flare and turning to adjust for side winds, 
you can really control, minutely control this craft in, in even a little turbulent situation, fly right along the ground. And uh, with a little bit of experience and some good basic training, um, any individual can fly one of these safely, have a great time and not have any uh, incidents. Whenever you take instruction for powered parachutes or for any aircraft uh, for that matter, uh, as instructors working with you and explaining things, if there's ever a question in your mind, the slightest question whatsoever of what he's trying to tell you, you don't quite understand it, you don't want to be bashful about asking him. And if you have an instructor that gets mad when you ask him questions, uh, I think I'd, I would probably consider maybe changing instructions or having a little talk with him say, look, I'm here to learn this and I'm really sorry if uh, my questions are bothering you, but if you don't feel that you can take time to answer my questions when I don't feel I understand something, then maybe I need to take instruction elsewhere. Because when it comes down to it, when you're up there flying, nobody but you is responsible for your safety. Nobody else is. I mean, when you get on there, it's your self that's up there. Nobody else is up there with you holding your hand. So if you have any questions about anything, you don't want to be bashful about asking and uh, so that you totally understand it. There are several good uh, manufacturers of powered parachutes. I frankly would uh, stay with one that's been around a decade or so that has experience, has a good track record. You want a, a company that's a good company that's solid and reliable and they're going to be here tomorrow if you need parts or later on two years from now they're still going to be here if you need some advice. So uh, that's the main thing, is stay with a solid company, one that has a good track record of uh, reliability, one that stands behind it, uh, their craft. If uh, you're interested in buying a used one, there's a lot of used ones around too. I'd be uh, um, very careful uh, about selecting a used one. If you're not real familiar with powered parachutes, you haven't built them yourself or assembled them, uh, it would be a good idea to find a qualified person to uh, look it over, uh, and uh, uh, make sure that it's airworthy and that it's uh, been put together right. You want to make sure that the cables are in good shape, that they use AN bolts, uh, aircraft bolts, that um, uh, there's no frayed lines. You want to check your canopy lines over very closely and make sure there's no frays or anything. If there are, have it sent it in to the, the manufacturer of the canopy and have it repaired by certified uh, canopy people. Um, you want to look and make sure that uh, you're not getting developing wear where the loops uh, go through these rings and uh, as long as uh, everything looks fine and uh, like I say I'd suggest having somebody qualified look it over um, there's a lot of good opportunities to buy buy uh, used aircraft and, and save yourself some money but the primary thing is you want to make sure it's safe to fly on when you buy a new one um, of course you you should buy it from a uh, an authorized dealer of that manufacturer. Like I say, um, you know, there's new companies that spring up and sell um, powered parachutes and they be, may be gone tomorrow and I don't think you want to get involved with something like that. But uh, if you buy a good brand, one that's been around for a while, you should uh, buy it through an authorized dealer. So that if, if you want to assemble it yourself, that's fine. I'd have the dealer check it over uh, or work with you just like you would in general aviation, you know. Uh, the FAA checks over aircraft that are built. It's just good common sense, you know, to make sure that it's, uh, the craft is built correctly. Whenever you are going to fly, you start off by pre-flighting the craft. That is to check it and make sure all the bolts and everything are in good condition and there's nothing about to fall off or nothing worn. So I start the front of the craft and I check and make sure that I can feel threads through the lock nuts. I make sure that all the linkages are good, pins and the keepers are in. Steering gear feels right. Don't have any problems there. And then I check steering tubes. Make sure the bolts are in them. They're going back to lock position. Um, check these connectors and make sure they're not loose, that they're tight. I don't see threads sticking out and uh, that these connectors are good and snug. They're not going to rattle loose. Then the lines you attach. I, I always take a peek and make sure there's no wear taking place in the lines where they hook to the rings. Make sure everything looks good. Then you check these and make sure that they're secure, that they're snug, that they're not loose and there's no thread showing. On all these connections. Look at the thimbles. Make sure that they're good. I'm working my way from the front to the back equally. So I check this side. Make sure that the safety rings are in and that the nuts are tight. 
making sure that these are all in good order. The lines look good. Pulleys loose. Now I check a starter rope up here. Make sure these bolts are all secure and that these bolts are secure and they have plenty of threads sticking through the nuts the required amount. Nothing looks like it's getting loose. Strobe lights secure. It's not going to come off. Starter rope pulley. This isn't loose. And I check and make sure the spark plug caps are pushed down snugly on the on the spark plugs. Make sure that the uh, the probe lines, the head temperature probe lines, are secure and they're not one of them broken and going to flop around. Then I simply take to check the carburetion. I, I move the carburetors around. They're on a flexible boot and they should move around, but you shouldn't see any movement between the boot and, and uh, the ports that they attach to. Calyx. Make sure the air cleaner's secure. Then check all the fuel lines. Make sure you don't see any fuel lines that appear to be leaking. Make sure that the fuel pump is secured and that the safety wires are on the lines. Check your electrical wires. Make sure nothing's come loose and flopping around. Then I check the primer and make sure it's secure. You just want to make sure that everything on the craft is going to stay like it is while you're in flight. I grab the fuel tank and I shake it. Make sure nothing's broken. Check the bolts there. I make sure that this nut is on the wheel. No, you're not about to lose a tire or a wheel. Check this bolts in. The actual rod looks good. It's not sagging. It's not cracked. Then just simply grab the cage and shake it. See if you can see any movement that doesn't, isn't normal. When that looks good, fuel lines look good. And then I check the, mounting, uh, the engine mounting plate bolts. Make sure they're secure. When that's good, then I move to the muffler springs. There's three of them on, on a Rotex. You check all three of these. Make sure safety wire is in place. None of these are broken. The engine mounting bolts. You want to check and make sure that the, the lock nut is collapsed and there's no gap in here. And then I grab the, the prop by the hub and I shake everything. I just move it around and see if there's any movement that doesn't belong there. Make sure everything's secure. Make sure the safety wire is on the nut. You don't want to lose the fluid out of the gearbox so that could seize you up. Then after I see that the springs are good on the mufflers, I grab it and I shake it and make sure there's nothing broken. You know, through vibration, everything looks secure. When I safety wire the springs, I run the wire through the spring loosely because there is flexibility in here. You don't want it tight. And then if, if a spring should break, this wire will help prevent a spring from going through the prop and damaging the prop, the leading edge on the prop. And uh, that's primarily what these safety wires are for. And the safety wires over a period of time will, through vibration will wear down too, so you need to check the wires themselves and make sure that they're in good condition. The exhaust system looks good. And in the, uh, the exhaust temperature probes, I check those and make sure they're intact. I check the, the uh, shroud screws and make sure that the, I can see that they're snug. They're not going to come loose. Look for anything that looks unusual. Anything that's out of order. You want to catch it now. It's a lot easier to take care of it here than it is when you're in the air. I pre-flighted the, the craft pretty good as far as its airworthiness looks pretty good. Now we got to check the fuel level. And this, is, this has a visual gauge. Just uh, You can actually see the fuel in it. A real good type of gauge to have because what you see is what you have. And it won't ever lie to you like some electronic gauges can. So, you know, I kind of like those. It's handy enough to see them. Now, when you go to fuel these up, you want to use a proof fuel. You want to use 90 octane or better in a Rotex engine. You want to make sure you use the proper uh, oil. These are two cycle engines and you have a 50 to 1 fuel mix. Uh, since this isn't equipped with uh, oil injection, you want to make sure that the fuel has no water or alcohol in it. Alcohol is hard on some of the synthetic parts in the fuel systems and lines. Plus, water, uh, alcohol tends to absorb moisture. What kind of oil do you use? I use a pins oil. I use uh, a pins oil uh, water air cool uh, two cycle motor oil. It's recommended by Rotex. Has the right numbers so that uh, it's recommended by the engine manufacturer. We've got it fueled up with the proper fuel. And again, I'm going to 
shake things around and make sure everything's secure one more time. All the important things I'm going to be hanging on while I'm flying. I want this to be a good experience. All right, we're going to start the engine and get it warmed up and make sure that it's functioning properly. I turn on both ignition switches, reach back and set the chokes, and take a slack out of the pulley. And the last thing you do before you pull a rope or before you start any aircraft is you yell, clear prop. And that way it makes you think consciously, is there anybody in harm's way or is a, is a prop going to pick up something and throw it at somebody? The danger zone between, uh, on a prop is from straight out from it and behind it. So you need to be in front of the prop. Okay, we're going to clear prop. Okay, I've just taxied up and I've got it pointed into the direction of the wind. And uh, one of the things I'd like to mention, you want to wear an approved safety helmet, one that's, that's going to protect you should, should you have if something happen. And uh, always wear glasses. Uh, when you're going through the grass, bugs fly up and stuff, and you don't want to get something in your eye when you're trying to take off and blur your vision. So you should always wear some sort of goggles or glasses whenever you're flying anything or... or uh, to protect your eyes. Now I'm going to set up the canopy. Uh, this canopy is made out of a ripstop nylon, zero porosity. That means the air can't pass through it. It has a coating on both sides. It's RV protected uh, for ultraviolet rays. It uh, has stitching sewed all the way through it on eighth inch centers both ways so that it can't rip. And I always put the canopy bag underneath the seat cover making sure it can't get out, nothing can come loose. And then on a two-seater, you have a seat belt in the back and you always, that held the canopy bag on, you always want to tighten that so it doesn't flop around and knock a fuel line loose or something and tie it up so it doesn't, end doesn't slap you while you're flying. Is there a reason why you would want to have this canopy bag with you on a flight? If the, it, I always take the canopy bag with me, I store it under the seat because if you should have to make a, unscheduled landing somewhere or you see somebody you want to visit and you land you want to have the bag with you that way you can pack the canopy up if you have to make an allergic uh, a uh, emergency landing in a field um, for some reason you want to be able to pack canopy up before the goats start eating it so it's a good idea to keep the canopy bag with you and now I'm going to check the lines and make sure that they're not tangled that none of them are twisted under or anything and then by pulling the two steel lines back, the two cables, with them parallel and not twisting. I know this outside D-ring should go to the leading edge of the canopy. Now the way these fly is this canopy, the leading edge has these large openings, these cells. And when you're flying forward, these catch wind and it pressurizes the canopy, puffs it up and makes it rigid like a wing is. And that's how it works. So you need to make sure that the canopy is laying right like it is. Okay, I've already pre-flied the craft. I've warmed it up. Uh, checked again the, the wind. It looks like I'm uh, aimed straight in the wind. And uh, make sure that when I go by, the canopy isn't going to catch anybody. I'm going to start it up, check my ignition, and then if everything's clear, go.